This is a basement foundation wall restoration project for my old uh, 1885 Toronto house downtown. And the whole thing started when I was getting quite a lot of water in the basement. And I did a little bit of a dig down to see what was going on. And I found that this downspout was connected to this sewer pipe, which in fact um, seemed to be blocked and uh, that seemed to be maybe part of the problem. And then I found actually a whole bunch of holes in this old fieldstone foundation. Um, but as I was looking around a little bit more, I noticed that there was water damage all the way up the wall here. And finally discovered that the eaves trough was really the main problem. There was water streaming down in front of the eaves trough all the way down the wall. And it was just a little bit of flashing there that was letting the water drain out over. And I corrected that and fixed a couple of shingles on the second roof up there. And the basement was totally dry. Um, the problem is that the foundation, um, you know, this was my first time ever kind of going into a foundation wall uh, that's made up of fieldstone like this, and um, didn't really know what I was getting into, and I guess n nobody should touch a shovel until they believe they're ready to, you know, get serious about the work and research and make sure that you're safe. But um, I discovered that the there is no footing on these uh, on this house, and I guess that's very common on these older Toronto houses. They just laid the field stones down in there, and they used uh, this lime mortar to um, pack it in, and then they built right on top of that. So, um, I having dug some uh, of the stones out, uh, I guess I felt like it was worth putting them back together and. Uh, spending a bit of time to repair the mortar um, and there were rodent entry points you know jump down and take a closer look as you can see you know on some of these gaps we're talking easily big enough for rats and mice to dig down and I did find some holes like that and um, so I decided to fill up some of the gaps and just do a little repair work on some of the mortar um, and initially started with concrete which turns out to be a bad idea um, Portland cement is uh, very destructive to these old fieldstone foundations um, and so I did some research uh, and discovered that what you're looking for is uh, natural hydro hydraulic lime uh, or NHL and I found that available at Cripe Maker in uh, Toronto on Industrial Street up in the northeast end. And so carefully not going too deep. This is about as far as, it, as you want to go or I want to go. It's uh, about, I don't know, 20 centimeters above the actual last rock of the foundation. Um, and so I've just been slowly and carefully peeling out some of the old dusty mortar and you can see uh, after all these years how this old lime mortar is um, you know basically just degraded into what's now almost sand I mean in some areas it's still quite firm so that's that's easily firm enough that I'm not you know, worried about that, and I, I think I can um, do this work and uh, where it's really needed in places like this, and uh, leave the existing mortar in in quite a few places. Here, it's actually quite quite solid still. Um, so it's just a minor repair. I mean, it's a big dig, but it's uh, not a complete replacement or reconstitution of the wall. And before I got started, I had um, a couple of uh, heritage masonry experts come out and take a look. Um, one was 
Hunt Masonry and the other was Toronto Masonry Repairs. Um, and they were, you know, kind enough to give me some information about what kind of mortar and, you know, techniques. Um, so, um, you know, the process is just kind of cleaning out and being careful not to um, go too far uh, and to dig in very s short sections. So this is about a, I don't know, two or three meter hole on this side. Um, and then... Um, mix the lime mortar. So the lime mortar comes in uh, a bag that you mix with brick sand and concrete sand. And uh, take a look at the other side. So here's a section of the wall and this is definitely the most you want to excavate at any one time. And should almost, you know, all of these projects you should uh, have some sort of professional advisor if you're not um, familiar with working with these kinds of walls because, you know, disasters can occur, these walls can fall apart and um, it would and could condemn a building and, you know, injure everyone involved. So, um, yesterday I finished the first round of mortar on this end of the building and you need to keep it moist with um, you know something like burlap or I've just been using uh, this landscaping cloth um, and then you just can spray it a day every day or a couple times a day depending on how hot it is and so let's take a look at how this mortar is doing so it takes a lot longer to cure than your uh, ordinary Portland cement. And uh, so you'll see this was yesterday. And it's still actually a little bit pliable in, um, you know, all of the deeper joints. And uh, some of the thinner joints that were mixed a little drier are, are starting to dry out pretty well now. But... Um, so this stuff takes apparently about a week, um, and that's a nice that's nicely packed there now um, to dry out um, or not dry out to cure, uh, and then it can take several months. So you want to plan to do this in Canada sometime in May, June, July, something like that, um, so that it has some time before the frost comes uh, to cure up and. Yeah, you can see, again, it's just, it's not a replacement, it's just um, kind of filling in some of the major gaps, primarily for rodent entry, but also it'll help with um, water, which wasn't a huge concern in this case, but um, once I'm done with this, I'll put in a plat platin memory or membrane, or platon membrane, um, which is just like a mirror drain plastic sheeting um, that just sits in front of the wall and keeps um, moisture out. Uh, and you can see that the brickwork here as well is old 1885 bricks and the homeowner that had the place before I did had parged here and added a concrete um, cement wall here and or just layer on top of the wall and you can just see that's that's even moving right there it had started coming up away from the wall and then the homeowner had caulked there, and then that caulking came away from the wall. And moisture, as you can see, just has been running down the wall and getting in behind the paint and got in behind the parging layer. And now I took a, some of that off, and you can see it's all that moisture is doing bad things to the brick. Here's a nice bit of spalling there with the, the face of the brick actually peeling off. So this is worst case scenario what happens when your um, brick is not protected from uh, water or is not exposed uh, properly to drying. Um, but you know the the concrete or so the the mortar here has done its job. Um, it's falling apart and receding and dusting into sand, and that's um, basically saving the brick. Uh, so the motor can be replaced and uh, 
we'll do that in sort of phase two once I get the foundation holes uh, all plugged up and uh, backfilled here and um, you know this is I guess in some ways a, a warning of the heritage guys said that um, you know paint can be very bad for buildings uh, especially uh, when it's this old brick because the water can easily get behind the paint as it kind of comes off the building depending on what kind of paint you use um, and the water just needs one entry point and then it starts to form pathways behind the paint all the way down and that eventually you know basically destroys the brick because the brick doesn't like being soaked in water all the time um, and it expands and contracts with the frost and that creates this uh, uh, result. Uh, so I might actually in the end just take all this paint off. Uh, most of the brick seems like it's in pretty good shape and uh, I'll then have a brick wall that can breathe and isn't damaged by frost cycles and moisture damage. Uh, so I guess that's sort of part two. Part one is just fixing this field stone and then, uh, you know, take it from there.